This is MPB News. Hi, this is Karen Brown. Thanks for checking out the Mississippi Edition podcast. If you like what you hear, click subscribe, hit like, or leave us a comment if your app has that feature. Then find other MPB podcasts by searching MPB Think Radio on your favorite podcasting platform. Thanks. Good morning. It's 8.30 on Tuesday, March 2nd. I'm Karen Brown, and this is Mississippi Edition on MPB Think Radio. On today's show, water outages continue in Jackson as treatment and distribution facilities struggle to reach pressure levels high enough to service parts of the city. Then the Mississippi Tax Freedom Act receives scrutiny from policy analysts and state leaders. Plus, the Mississippi Public Service Commission announces a comprehensive review of the state's utility infrastructure. This is Mississippi Edition on MPB Think Radio. Water outages continue in the capital city following last month's severe winter event. Prolonged temperatures at or below freezing during the storm caused officials to shut down the city's water treatment and distribution facilities. Since returning online, the systems have not yet reached the pressure necessary to service parts of the city located far from the plants. During a briefing yesterday, Public Works Director Charles Williams said the department is doing a number of things to restore water. We've been opening up fire hydrants, trying to release air out of the system in efforts to help push water along those areas that are that we know that are still without water. Uh, we are seeing the benefit of that work, but more work is still needed to be done. We're trying to get a definitive timeline when when water will be restored to all of our citizens. We know that some have been restored, and we are uh, pleased with that. But we're still heavily concerned about our residents who are in South Jackson and those members who live off Forest Hill Road who continue to suffer, our residents who are in Brook Lee who continue to suffer, and then other little pockets throughout the city, those residents who continue to suffer without water. And we're working as hard as we can in order to get it restored. We're also working on water main breaks. We've been doing that every day. And we'll continue to do that until we get all of them completed. Jackson Mayor Shokwe Antar Lumumba says the city's facilities were not meant to be shut down for days as they were during last month's storm. He says full restoration of water service comes down to one key factor. We have to be a little more precise, right? Because the question says when we will get a handle on it. Uh, What we are dealing with today is not a lack of our public works department having a handle on the issue as it is what it takes in order to to see the solution that we're asking for. Time is what it takes. Our system was never meant to be shut down in the way that it's shut down. And so when it is shut down like that and storage tanks are depleted, when consumption is high, and then we have to fill up the entire city again, right? That is not what a public works department or a water treatment facility is faced with in a regular event, in a regular occurrence that happens day, every day we deal with a break, right? Every day we deal with, you know, uh, a pipe or, or maybe a piece of equipment that, that may be challenged. But when the production of water into our distribution system is depleted to this level, that is what it takes. It's time. They're doing what it takes. So they have a grip on what needs to be done. It's just a matter of the time that it takes for all of that to fill back up. Mamumba also recognizes the city's current issues are a symptom of an old and failing infrastructure. He says these concerns predate his tenure and are indicative of the nation's legacy cities. Uh, what I do know is that the repairs to our infrastructure, the repairs to our aging uh, pipes and, and roads are long overdue. Uh, I know that we have, you know, we make millions of dollars of investment into it each and every year as a city. Uh, we constantly invest into, you know, our pipes, our water treatment facility, you know, uh, the sewage, the roads, all of these things that our residents depend on. Uh, but we're making millions of dollars of investment when we have about a $2 billion issue overall. Uh, and so uh, we need the understanding, and, and we know that we're not the only city in this position. Uh, many of our legacy cities around the nation, those are aging cities, cities that, that you know, have been around for quite some time are dealing with the issues of crumbling infrastructure. And so I think that this is the moment that not only do we have the recognition and we should get the support from the state, but we should also get the support of the federal government as well. 
City officials are continuing to urge residents who have water to practice con- conservation until the system can reach the pressure needed to fully service all parts of the city. Coming up, the Mississippi Tax Freedom Act receives scrutiny from policy analysts and state leaders. This is Mississippi Edition on MPB Think Radio. Hi, I'm Ryder Taff, Portfolio Manager at New Perspectives, a fee-only financial advisory and co-host of Money Talks. Each week, we take your personal finance questions and tell you about a money topic we hope you find helpful. Money Talks can be heard Tuesdays at 9 a.m. on MPB Think Radio. Podcasts can be found on our website, money.mpbonline.org, or on your smart device's podcasting platform. This is Mississippi Edition on MPB Think Radio. I'm Karen Brown. The Tax Freedom Act is now in the Senate, where it is also receiving scrutiny from the chamber's top official. Lieutenant Governor Delbert Hoseman says the bill raises questions, especially regarding where revenues would balance cuts. He shared more on the bill during a press conference yesterday. This bill uh, is exceptionally long. It further has several unintended consequences in it. For example, that advantage jobs credit, you get a credit on your taxes for employing people. Uh, that, that goes away because there aren't any taxes uh, on your benefit. Uh, it, it affects our farmers. Uh, speaking with uh, the commissioner the other day, he has come out against the bill. He indicated that on a typical farm tractor, it would be an extra $8,000 for per tractor. Uh, when you go, when you look at uh, the electric cost of electricity, it's going up, according to them, 12 to $17 million a year. Uh, time after time, you look at different different issues that are that have come up through this nonprofits, for example. Uh, there won't be uh, a tax deduction. How does that affect nonprofits? And that's that's why we need to have a measured approach to this. Uh, this allegedly is about a two point six billion dollar change in the budget when you include all of the phase outs that have been proposed by the House. There are a lot of unintended consequences here and questions that I have. Uh, I've asked the state economists to model out what happens. When you have this huge of a change in economics from someone who is making money paying taxes to someone who is paying on a sales tax revenue plus a whole bunch of other things, uh, electric bills and tractors and manufactured goods and all these other things that were increased in here. When you have that, you have economic consequences. Either they don't sell as many tractors or they buy them somewhere else or something happens. Same with everything as you go forward here. Therefore, it deserves and is entitled to, for us to give deep scrutiny to each of these, to invite people in. Let's talk about this. How or where are we? Uh, I've had the first projections done by an accounting firm about what the tax liabilities would be for most Mississippians at 30, 50, 100. They seem to be favorable when I've got the first, first allocations. What's very, what's very, uh, un, unsure is whether the revenue will be there that they're claiming will be there. It was last week that House Republicans introduced the Mississippi Tax Freedom Act, a tax reform bill advocates claim will attract new business and create new economic opportunities in the state. But some analysts say the plan could be ineffective in accomplishing that. Meg Weehy is Deputy Executive Director at the Institute of Taxation and Economic Policy. In part two of her conversation with our Michael Guidry, Weehy breaks down that philosophy and the philosophy and offers a comparative analysis to other states that have undergone similar restructuring. Republican lawmakers who introduced this bill and who often champion it, um, it, they've called it the Mississippi Tax Freedom Act. Um, Part of the rhetoric is to open up the state for business, attract business, uh, and create a tax structure that uh, to some reflects more personal freedom i.e. the higher sales tax, lower income tax, um, and not tax, not tax productivity, not tax work, but tax choices in the marketplace. Um, based on a, on a tax policy standpoint and perspective, um, does this type of policy uh, create 
job growth? Does it create economic growth uh, in a state when you when you maybe look at comparative models? No, it doesn't. Um, we've looked at um, we've we've done a couple of comparative models. One is just to compare compare states with a strong like the highest reliance on a personal income tax to states um, without an income tax. And there is absolutely nothing about the lack of a personal income tax in a state like Texas or a state like Florida that makes it more competitive um, than, a, than a, even, even a state like California or New York that has a stronger reliance on, on personal income taxes. There's, there's no sort of competitive edge to how their economy is performing. And then we have a really recent um, experiment in fact, the, the governor at the time was, called it an experiment um, in Kansas um, and in 2012, then Governor Sam Brownback um, put into place massive income tax cuts um, with also um, a glide path, as he called it, to income tax elimination over 10 years with the promise that, um, that all of this revenue would be made up by more people moving to the state of Kansas, more businesses moving to the state of Kansas, that it would, his, his words were, it would be an adrenaline shot into the economy. And that was not the case. Um, the state found itself having to make significant spending cuts, um, even the very next year and over the years. And within five years, a new set of policymakers um, you know, came in, came into in charge and and largely undid or fully undid um, those notorious brownback tax cuts because they were nothing but disastrous for um, for the state. Meg, we've looked at and discussed a lot of the, the the keynotes of this tax plan, but it is a comprehensive and detailed plan. Uh, are there any other things within this plan that we haven't discussed that you think is noteworthy? Well, one of the things um, that I think it's it's worth, um, I guess, there are two things, a couple of things that I would that I would point out that aren't maybe specific about the plan, but there are because of the design of the um, the state personal income tax, there are a number of people, um, including older adults, who are really who who, won't, who don't benefit at all from eliminating the personal income tax because they're already not paying personal income tax. Um, in the state, Mississippi is one of only three states that fully exempts retirement retirement income um, from the tax code from the tax code, including Social Security income. Um, if you're again, if you're low or moderate income um, household in the state, you're likely already paying little to no personal income tax, but you are paying significantly um, higher um, sales taxes. So, you know, we've concentrated a lot and I've talked a lot about who stands to lose from the plan. Um, but I think it is also important to note that at the end of the day, um, particularly with each year as this plan continues to ratchet down the personal income tax, that this is a real, this is a significant giveaway to um, the state's, the state's wealthiest residents who will, will garner the vast majority of the benefit from, um, from eliminating the, the personal income tax. Well, Meg Weehy, the Deputy Executive Director for the Institute on Taxation and Economic Policy, thank you so much for your time and for the great information. Yeah, thank you so much as well. The state income tax accounted for $1.8 billion in revenue during the last fiscal year, which ended June 2020. The Partnership for a Healthy Mississippi is joining other health advocate groups in calling on the state Senate to amend House Bill 1439 to increase the cigarette tax by $1.50 per pack. Currently, the Mississippi Tax Freedom Act calls for a low 50 cents per pack cigarette tax increase. Mississippi's current tobacco tax is one of the lowest in the nation, and Sandra Shelson, executive director of the partnership, says the modest raise in the House's plan would still not be the, uh, not bring the state up to the national average. The national state average is a dollar eighty eight per pack. So at sixty eight cents, we're at the very low end, 
And even with the current proposal to increase it by 50 cents, we would still be significantly below the national average. Advocates estimate the tax increase could decrease youth smoking by approximately 14.5 percent and save Mississippi $584.53 million in long-term health care costs. Coming up, the Mississippi Public Service Commission announces a comprehensive review of the state's utility infrastructure. This is Mississippi Edition on MPB Think Radio. Southern Remedies, Relatively Speaking, is a show that explores issues that relate to you and your family. To find out what we're all about, subscribe to the podcast by using any podcast app or by downloading our MPB Public Media app. This podcast is a local production of Mississippi Public Broadcasting and depends on the support of listeners like you. If you can, please donate today at mpbonline.org. And thanks. This is Mississippi Edition. I'm Karen Brown. Mississippi's three public service commissioners are unanimously announcing a comprehensive review of the Magnolia State's public utility infrastructure. The review comes on the heels of a recent winter storm that has resulted in lingering after effects, both at home and in other areas of the region, like Texas, where residents went days in frigid temperatures without electricity. Dane Maxwell is chair of the commission. He shares more with our Kobe Vance. Having witnessed some of the, you know, terrible moments that other states uh, went through, we want to make sure that we're proactive in, in maintaining our system and the integrity of it. The, the thing about Mississippi is unique because we do, uh, we do often have these things come up, especially hurricanes and tornadoes. And there's, you know, there's many things that we do now protects the grid. Uh, the reality is we can do better job. Uh, we want to, we want to be able to, and if, 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 if we can, we're, we fully intend to. I was curious if there's any uh, weak areas that y'all have already identified or ones that you're looking into. Well, certainly uh, any of those areas that have uh, lines above ground is, is a weakness in itself. Uh, one of the discussions that we've recently had is are the power companies doing what they need to do to trim trees away from the lines? Because a lot of the things that happened was uh, the heavy branches was falling and then they would hit the power lines uh, and and then disable uh, and people were losing power that way. We are unique uh and that we have so many natural disasters. So we have to take extraordinary steps, uh, probably that others don't have to. Now, you know, ice storms don't come that often to Mississippi, but when they do, especially in the north part of the state, we need to be prepared for them. And so that's one of the areas that we're, we've, we first uh, started looking at. How did Mississippi com- uh, compare to other states surrounding us? Uh, especially over there in Texas, where they had a, just a, a laundry list of issues. We produced more electricity than than we needed on the coldest day. So uh, we had already made preparations. The utilities had made preparations, and they ha- handled the outages. The unique thing about Texas is is they're um, they're all they're all alone. They don't. They don't have the ability uh, to to move power from one area to another, meaning state wise. It's unique and, and always the easiest way is there's a lot of uh, things going on and, and it's a complicated thing. But the easiest way to explain it is you have you have four interconnects. You have uh, Quebec, which is Canada, North America, and then you have the Midwest interconnect. Uh, the the Western interconnect, and then you have the Eastern interconnect, and then you have ERCOT, which is the Texas system. Uh, we share everything in a group called MISO. We share power from all of those except ERCOT. ERCOT is on their own. They're like their own nation. And so 
their problem is they don't they want to be a standalone energy grid without the help of any other the any other areas so they don't have the resources now that may change now that they went through this terrible uh scenario and although they don't come um often this is this is a result of them wanting to be a standalone energy grid and uh and you couldn't the rolling blackouts were because they didn't have any way to shift power into them because they're not connected to the others how how much did that help mississippi in uh, maintaining power did did the state produce enough energy on our own or did we have to rely on some other states helping us out no we always rely on those um but we we did produce we did produ- produce enough uh, energy, and we we regulated those outages um, in other areas to keep, you know, just to keep our grid up and 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 working. So now I think I think our utilities I would I would put them up against anyone's, but the thing like you have in devastating tornadoes and hurricanes that that damage the system so far. Uh, we can move power from other areas and bring it into Mississippi. And two, it it also provides us a resource because we all work together. So if, uh, if we go down, you know, Alabama's Alabama pushes over here, uh, Tennessee pushes over here, Louisiana pushes over here, Georgia, Florida, they all come to our rescue and help us, you know, just like we do them. So it's a good partnership. I also wanted to talk about um, another one of Mississippi's public resources, which is water. Uh, in the city of Jackson, they've been facing issues um, all all since last Tuesday, um, where some residents don't have running water in their homes. Is the Public Service Commission working with Jackson um, and to help get that back online and looking at ways to help prevent something like that from happening again in the future? No, uh, we we actually don't regulate um, municipalities, so we've uh, we'll be glad to do anything that we can do legally to support them and help them and give them some advice and show them some things but they haven't reached out to us and uh they're really uh municipalities are really their own their own uh entity so they would have to you know ask for help and reach out to us commissioner maxwell is there anything else that uh, we might not have talked about that you wanted to tell mississippians about coming out of the storm or going into the next coming weeks well, I just I'd like them to know that we were fully engaged during before, during and after. We worked very closely with MEMA uh in addition to the federal uh folks, the FEMA folks. We have very strong relationships with our surrounding states and we keep a we keep a good watch on the these systems. It's unfortunate that sometimes things like this cause outages, but that's what we learn from, and we'll learn out of this one, and we'll continue to do a better job for the great payers of Mississippi. Dane Maxwell is the chairman of the Public Service Commission. Dane, thank you for talking with us today. Thank you for uh, the call. This has been Mississippi Edition on MPB Think Radio. Thanks for listening to the Mississippi Edition podcast from MPB News and MPB Think Radio. Don't forget to subscribe if you haven't already. And if your app lets you, leave a comment or review. We really do appreciate it. Remember, you can always get in touch with MPB News on Facebook and Twitter. And fresh episodes of the podcast are posted every weekday morning. I'm Karen Brown. Thanks for listening. This is